Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, first let me remind you about the book Dave and I are working on. This is the icon for the book, the Double Apple. Apple inside of an apple, and the name of the book is Principia Mathematica 2. And you can go read about it in at this website, Principia Mathematica 2.com. Well, today's video is about the transistor. It uh, it's been done. I've done it once before. Hacked it once. If you would, if you would. Uh, Understand that um, this is hacking it twice. I've been working on it to get it in the book, and things weren't working well for me, and I'm having to rethink some of the things that uh, I had said before. Well, this is the link uh, called the transistor. This was hack one, but I didn't call it that, and that's the link to it if you'd like to watch it again. Uh, related to this, as I go on to describe some of the things that I've learned since then, uh, you may want to look at these. Actually, these uh, are very popular in terms of people watching them, explaining them how to measure the mass of the electron. But there's something in that video that helped clear up some things about the transistor. Quite interesting. Well, it was August 27th, 2020. Yeah, that was four days ago. Yeah, I went out for lunch Thursday, August 27th to Duffy's Bar and Grill to remember the many times my wife and I went there. Yeah, uh, she and I went out to dinner together on Thursday every week. But after she was gone, I was by myself and uh, I prefer going out to lunch. But every Thursday, I like to celebrate that dinner or lunch with her. Duffy's was her favorite restaurant. And as you might expect, the service was slow due to the pandemic, so I had time to think, and somehow an idea occurred to me that helped clarify something about the resistor, transistor. Well, later that same day, I'm, I'm home relaxing, and I decided to watch a movie, and it was uh, Nights in Rodanth, uh, and uh, as you guessed it, while I was watching the movie, a second idea came to me. All of this came about because I've been working on the book and I've been thinking about the transistor and it's, mo it's apparently going around inside my subconscious mind and popping these things into my head. I was hoping to make the explanation of the transistor easier, but when I was working on the book, it was getting worse and there's things I couldn't explain, but now I had two ideas. I said, wow, this, let me try this out. And so I worked on this presentation. So the first idea starts with the problem. Why does the base current of the transistor return to its source? When I was doing the trying calculations and a little bit of, of math on paper, I, it wasn't returning right. And, and I said, well, you know, it has to return to the source. I learned that in college. That's a, and it actually seems to be true. In my experience, the base current starts at the base uh, power supply battery and it works around and it's, it's, that's the way it is. But the particle model, at this point, the particle model gave me no reason for that. Well, the first idea starts, well, excuse me, I'm supposed to skip, there we go. Here's the problem. In the figure on the right, the G1s from VBB, this is the base battery, the G1s from there combine with the G1s from VCC, which are coming this way, they combine, add together, and, they're, and now they go through. Some of them go this way and some of them go that way. And it was my thought last time with the first video that it was based on these two resistors. That 
it would bend to this combined number would split this way and that way based on the values. But that didn't get the same amount back. When I was doing the calculations, I didn't get the right amount of back on what it cycle and cycle. It, it, it was just wrong. Uh, so some, it's not that simple. And this, but I, I know from experience that the current, now normally you talk about current flow this way, the current flow through this resistor, through the transistor, through the battery are all the same, or nearly so. Well, you know, I wasn't getting that result. So I decided maybe it had to be separate. The only way that could happen is if there were separate paths. It, 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 and I said, then I'm asking myself, why in the world would there be separate paths? Uh, these, surely these combine and get all mixed up and so on. Well, this is where the other two videos come in. Uh, when I was explaining the uh, mass of the electron, this is a this is one of the videos here that uh, is uh, explaining it, and uh, as a result, you get a, a circular flow in the middle here. Circular flow, and that's controlled by uh, G two gravity. Uh, these are the net F2 forces that are keeping this circular flow of electrons, or in the case of the particle model, G1 particles flowing in a circle. Not only that, when they come out of the gun, the electron gun, they actually have a uh, magnetic field around them that develops. That's the only way I could make this thing work, was to have a magnetic field around this. And, and I'm starting to think, well, maybe that magnetic field along with the G2 forces are actually the thing that causes this to stay separate. This may stay separate because there's a magnetic field around it and G2 forces in particular holding it together, going around, same with this. Same when they combine back here, they don't mix somehow. They have separate paths. So there are definitely here uh, two circuits here. And, and, and we can, I can now treat them independently. Well, uh, so if they are separate, then how does the base current affect the collect current? If this is separate from this, so the explanation uh, so is still a matter of the combination of the fact that there's both of these in the transistor. A small increase in this battery increases the force. Here I've drawn the force. Uh, there's G2 forces all the way around this uh, whole circuit and the transistor. We're interested when it comes to the speed of the electron. We're interested in this particular direction of the force. It's strong based on the G2 mass of the transistor and of the G1s in the, uh, flowing through it. So it was a small increase in this, increases the, uh, the number of these, which increases F2. When you increase F2, then the speed of both of these increase. And you have to have the speed of this increase because it's going to maintain a fixed voltage drop of 0 0.7 volts for, uh, for certain uh, transistors. And, and the speed helps do that. When I explained the diode, I explained that speed did that. Well, speed also affects that force causes these to go faster. The average speed in here is faster due to the force. It speeds up to this point, slows down, but the average speed is still higher. Which means when you get to this, going through here, you miss a lot. A faster particle will miss more. So there's less coming out. Well, there's less loss, excuse me. And there's more coming out, causing more G1s to flow around this way. So an increase here causes you to lose less. More, You end up with more. And now both circuits can work to a point of stabilization. You change this by one volt, 
and this has to stabilize. And while it's stabilizing, this is changing. The forces are changing. The speed is increasing, assuming this was an increase. And then eventually when this will stabilize, and then shortly after, apparently this stabilizes, and you have a new, uh, a new setup. But the only way this base current is returns this way, or for that matter, the collector current returning this way, I should say G1's returning this way, is that the paths are separate. And I'm saying that's because of the magnetic field and the forces around the stream that's flowing this way and around the separate stream flowing that way. Only way I could figure out it happened. Is it really happening that way? Well, you know, uh, the particle model gives me tools to, to help solve this, but it's also limiting me. I, I, I can't just throw anything in there, and, and I didn't throw this idea of separate paths in there independently, because in effect, I, I had already used it in explaining the electron flow and the uh, measure of the mass of the electron. Well, uh, it, I, the, the direction it flows is very complex inside. Uh, you've got the transistor, you've got the flows, and, and it just it looks like it's simply you've got an F2 force that's uh, uh, controlling this internally. But obviously, this is very, very complex. Um, Typically, current flows into the base, and they show it going this way. Well, this is a reasonable picture of a cross-section of a transistor, but it's not precise. It isn't that clean and sharp by any means. So chances are the current actually flows this way, or in the case of the G1 model, particle model, it flows this way, you know, caused by the F2 forces inside here. Same thing with the collector current coming in here going that way. It probably flows this way. Or who knows? I don't know how it flows. But somehow these have to be separate and, and the G1s have to enter the emitter and go out the base and maintain that flow so that each circuit works properly. Well, let's take a look a little bit about what's going on and take an example. Uh, this is a circuit I've shown before, which is a general circuit uh, that matches this. This is the ideal uh, 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 IV curve for a transistor. It's not perfect. But what it does for me is it allows me to use this quiescent state point, the Q point. It's an operating point for the transistor. When you design it, you set this thing up so it's operating here. This is the load line of the transistor. And as you vary the, uh, uh, the signal into the uh, base, uh, you're varying the current up and down. You're actually moving up and down the load line. And what I did was I calculated these values using this quiescent point. For example, on the, the base sign, if you assume, a, I actually calculated that it's nearly, a, if I use 60 microamps into a, a resistor using 3 volts on the battery, I can calculate the value of that resistance at 50K. And I can do the same thing on the collector side. Uh, you can see that the uh, it's got a 12 volt battery because that's the maximum for the uh, voltage across the uh, transistor. <coughs> so I'm assuming a 12 volt battery and, and when you calculate that against this resistor you find out it needs to be a 300 ohm resistor if you're going to have uh, 6 volts across the transistor you're going to have 6 volts across the collector resistor and you're going to, that means it has to be 300 ohms. So I, based on this Q point I'm, I'm estimating that this circuit, that's what it should be. So that's trying to kind of a base to go forward. Okay, so now what I'm saying is uh, this circuit has to be stable. This is 3 volts, this is 12 volts. 
these numbers for G1s are not the total number flowing. I'll get to that in a moment. But these, uh, you know, if I assume this is the same thing I assumed over and over again, that the volts per G1 is 0 0.1. So if this is a 3-volt battery, you divide 0 0.1 into 3, you get 30. It's outputting every, every interval of time, 30 G1s. You lose 0.7 volts here, which means you're going to lose 7 G1s here which leaves that you must lose 23 G1s here if this is to be balanced, if I'm going to be uh, balanced. Uh, these are the numbers that are added and lost. It's not the total number flowing, but it's the number added and lost. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the values we have at the quiescent point. Well, what happens if I change the base current up to 80 microamps. I get a new operating point down here at 4 volts. So let's see what happens there. So I moved up from here to there. And I have a new operating point. The voltage uh, is going to be 4 volts across the transistor. Well, it was, uh, by the way, I didn't cover that earlier. It was 60 and 60. Now it's 40 here, so it must be 80 lost there. And the, and the number went from 30 to 40, while I went from 3 to 4. Uh, so you know, here you, you change the uh, this battery voltage to here, and after a bit of time it stabilizes both sides. And these are the values you get. Notice that when you went from 3 to 4 volts and you now have more G1s flowing through, you have a higher speed. Instead of losing uh, 60, you're losing only 40. You're losing less because these are going faster and don't hit. And if, they, if you uh, lose less, you're putting more in, and that's why this goes down and that goes up. It's exactly the way a transistor works. So, uh, so that's a, a jump. That's a jump of one volt here and there. Now I went ahead to kind of compare the gain of these two circuits. What's the gain when it's at the quiescent point? What's the gain when it was uh, at the uh, this uh, four volts, three volts here versus four volts there? These are the same pictures I had before. This is where the uh, at the quiescent point, Q point, it said you lost 6 volts across the uh, transistor, leaving 6 volts across this. That's what I failed to explain for that one. And so now you increase from 3 to 4, and I, I calculated, I went through a process of calculating or the value around this resistor. First calculated how many were going into there, then I subtracted the 23 and got 70. Well, it was actually 69, but I'm, this is, these are not precise. In no way are these precise. By the way, I also use the interaction factor of 5 times 10 to the minus 6. That's it's part of that calculation. So what it implies is there's 70 G1s flowing all the time around here. You add 30 to 70, you get 100. Minus 7 is 93, minus 23 is back to 70. That's a stable circuit. Did the same thing for this one, uh, calculating the, uh, the uh, A1 value here and, uh, and for this one as well. So I found out that A1 is 70 and A2 is 40,000 here by calculating uh, how many came out here using the interaction factor and, and uh, so you have 40,000 at point A2. You add 120, you lose 60, you lose 60, you're back to 40,000. A lot. It's a lot primarily because this number is so small and that's an arbitrary number. I just picked it. You don't have to believe any of these numbers. I'm just kind of showing you uh, how the thing actually works with the G1 particle. So what you can do is I can, I, can, I can calculate the gain. This 
gain I calculated based on the two resistors. 50K divided by 300 would imply this circuit has a gain of 166. In this case, I used the, uh, the increase of the A1, which was 130 over, uh, at two, from 70 to 130, which it means it increased by 60. And it went from 40,000 to 53,000 here, which is an increase of 13,000, which has a gain of 217. So you can see that the resistors are still playing a role in the gain function. It's determining the gain. Uh, okay, they're not exact. Uh, that's a, a fake. I'm using a, a, an ideal IV curve, and, uh, and I'm, I'm rounding off numbers. I'm picking random numbers here. But it's interesting to see what happens. So what's the conclusion? Conclusion is the current has to return to its source, and the only way I can figure that out for the model is that the G1 flow of the base and emitter must be separate. The G2 force field holds each stream together, including a magnetic field that flows around it. Internal G2 forces guide the flow of the two streams. It guides the base G1s move to the base and the collector G1s to the collector. It's a very complex situation involving the transistor, the G1s flowing through it, and the, the two resistors. It, it, it's all there, and G2 gravity has to figure out what forces it's going to use to make that work. Okay, and as far as amplification, as the uh, base current flows, then the F2 force increases, causing the G1s to speed up. Fewer G1s hit and scatter, causing a lower VCE drops. This increases the G1 flow in the collector, and as you saw, the numbers show that there is a gain of G1s uh, from the uh, gain from the added G1s in the emitter circuit. You get more G1s added in the collector circuit. This uh, it's quite interesting, but. I haven't finished the calculations, and I'm not sure. If I don't get the calculations done by the time uh, the book is out, it probably won't be included. But I'll eventually get there, hopefully before that. But uh, that's hack three will be. Well, when I get out of transistor hack three, I'll be showing you actual spreadsheet calculations. The difficulty is I got to include some speed up factor in the calculations to make it work. Uh, so it's not going to be easy. My name is Bob DeHilster and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time while I'll explain more of the particle model using the universe. Yeah, I got it switched around. Thank you for your attention.